Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Intentional Agribusiness Leader podcast. This is Mark, your host, and I'm on with John Lehman with Hello Nature today. I have to be careful what word follows hello because there's another company that sounds sort of similar. And if you're not paying attention, <laughs> we, we get, get that wrong. Confused, uh, we get a few calls every uh, uh, every month or so on uh, looking for Hello Fresh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so John Lehman with Hello Nature. I've actually, you know what? This is funny. I got to share this story before we get into it, John. So, um, there is a, there's another public speaker out of California, also named Mark Jewell, spelled exactly the same, J E W E L L. Okay, and he targets, uh, let's say, like the energy market. So, like electrical companies and states where you can build a company to uh, where you can like compete against the other electric companies. Right. And so okay. he tr trains sales teams on how to do that. And so he's known as the high energy um, sales trainer guy. And I'm known yep. as a high energy trainer speaker guy. And so I will occasionally get leads for him. Well, one time I get this guy who booked, who called up to book and said, are you Mark Jewell? Are you the, you know, do you, do you do training? on on how to position value um and you're a high, and you're a high energy speaker i said yeah that's me and i ended up bidding the project and never heard back could never get in touch with the guy again and i just sort of wrote it off and i moved on with life well, about four months later um, i get a call from the same guy saying hey you're um you haven't booked your booth yet and and booked your hotel room for the event it's coming up i need you to get a book i said you never booked me and he screamed. I mean, he was mad. He thought I screwed this whole thing up. He didn't realize he called the wrong Mark Jewell yeah. <laughs> the first time. He must have got a hold of him the second time and then ended up booking him. But then when then apparently that guy needed to still book his stuff. So he ended up calling me again and chewed my butt. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. For not following through. So yeah. anyway, hopefully that other guy ended up getting the deal. He's I hope I didn't. Hire a snack thing, but, uh, right. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need somebody like that. So, yeah. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for hearing. You let me uh, humor the group and the the listeners with my little story to start it off here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so, great talk to, to you. Here, yeah, super glad to have you here. Um, let's let's just dive into this right away. We're talking about intentional leadership as we do in every episode. What does it mean for you to be intentional, John? Yes, I thought about that question, uh, Mark. A word kind of comes to my mind is transparency. Hmm. And um, so to be intentional, thinking of it in the context that, you know, you want to go a certain direction, uh, a particular strategy with your group or your team. And transparency to me gives them uh, a little bit of the why behind it. And so I try and share uh, as much information as I can uh with with uh the guys and the team members so that they understand um uh, where we want to go why we want to go there and uh, it helps them you know uh, get it clear in their mind where we need to be and what we're doing so i think transparency is important uh when you're being intentional another uh thing that i to stay intentional for us uh for me anyways is really discerning between opportunistic and strategic. And of course, when you're in the sales and kind of an entrepreneurial business, you get lots of opportunities, but may not be the best suited opportunity for the organization. And yet your, your appetite kind of wants to chase them down, right? Everybody loves to go for the, go, for, go on the hunt and see if they can get the kill. And it might be a nice uh, temporary win, if you will, but it's, it really doesn't parlay into where we're going strategically and where yeah. we need to, the steps we need to take on a long-term goal and direction. So uh, being transparent and then also really being honest about what's opportunistic and does this opportunity fit in our strategy? Is it neutral to it? Is it counter to it? And just having that gut check. And that's that's not always easy to do, but necessary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, and I think there's, there's an important piece in that transparency as you're helping people discern between opportunistic and strategic, right? Because 
if I'm a salesperson and I'm incentivized by some sort of a commission or bonus or whatever, and, and I'm sniffing out some opportunity and somebody's remotely interested, right? My, my instinct is to want to pursue that, <laughs> right? Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how do you help? How do, you, how do you leverage that transparency? What does that conversation sound like to be able to help your, your people understand the difference and, and be okay with letting some stuff go? Because that can be, you know, I yeah. mean, I've had to talk with my team in the past. I'm like, this is, you know, this one's just not a good prospect. Let's go find another one. Yeah. Well, they, the, for us, uh, for example, one, one way might be is uh, we're pretty transparent about our margins on mm -hmm. our product lineup. So if a guy that's managing a geography understands that if I spend too much time here, it might be an easier sale, but it, it doesn't give me the margins to meet our, our margin goals. And so it isn't just, Hey, we're better off to sell this one versus better off to sell that one. Okay. He can process that, but you know, uh, they may not really fully buy into what they're saying, but if he can see it in a black and white way, look, you're spending a lot of energy, uh, on this product and it's, it's not near, uh, you know, helping you. It's not helping you really get to your goal. And, um, so you know, they can understand it better. I just as a interesting note, I went through this on a kind of a customer review with one of our team members, uh, last fall. And, um, uh, he was spending a, a very significant piece of his time trying to cultivate this particular account, but it was generating only, you know, four or 5% of his total revenue. And, put that in black and white and all of a sudden then it starts to make sense. I could see, ah, you know, it, it helps. So just yeah. trying to give them the right information. So they understand the, the, the why behind the direction you're trying to give or coaching you're, you're putting in front of them. Right. Do you, do you find this to be true in your business in some ways where there's, I call it the 80, 20 rule. It's Pareto, Pareto's principle, right? Which is roughly maybe 80% of my business probably comes from about 20% of my customer base. And then there's the long tail theory where there's a lot of smaller customers that make up the other 20%, but they may be uh, it's, it's sometimes what I find uh, sellers that we coach end up they're, they're, they're getting distracted, spending a lot of time. And in fact, maybe their highest stress customers are some of the, uh, the 80% that are generating the 20% the of the results. Do you find the same thing? Uh, at my whole career, I found that same thing. Uh, my, my first sales manager uh, talked to me about the 80-20 rule, and um, it's been true throughout my whole career. And mm -hmm. it's um, no matter how hard you try and overcome it, um, it just doesn't seem to. There's just something about the law of nature that says that's the way it's going to be. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because what I find is so many people come into our programs. You'll get to see this when you, when you come to our thriving leader program, and there's going to be a lot of people that are looking for help in the work-life balance category. They're looking for help in the time management category. They're, they're wanting to reduce emotional stress in their life. And, uh, and that, and though, and they perceive those things to be impeding on their ability to live a higher quality life. Okay. And so when we start diving in, if we start looking under the hood a little bit, what we generally find is they're allocating a ridiculous amount of their time to the 80% of the people that are only generating maybe 20%. And they're not, they're not allocating as much time to the ones that are actually getting them paid. They're actually getting them fed, you know? Yeah. And yep. you, 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 uh, you can be on the, you can be the hamster in the wheel. Mm -hmm. And really spending a lot of energy, but you're not making forward progress mm -hmm. and you got to set, step back and uh, that 80, 20 will always be there. And you need part of that 20 to round out. Right. So uh, some effort is going to be required, but you just got to keep it in balance and review it uh, on a regular basis. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, attraction and retention, you know, in, in your, in your style of business, what's been working for you or what have you seen that's really worked over the years in your experience from a, from a leadership perspective? Yeah. Uh, well, probably the most important is 
um, when I've done a good job and our team's done a good job of making the right hire in the first place mm-hmm. is probably num- number one. And I've made a lot of them that I wish I hadn't over the 35 years in the business. Right. And it's not so much about whether the person is a good person or not, or talented or not. Uh, do they have the right personality? Do they have the right uh do they operate well under how we manage our management strategies and principles? Um, does it does it fit within that? They have mm-hmm. a lot better chance of success, mm-hmm. and um, that's that's the number one way to keep a good employee is to make a good hire in in the first place. Uh, then, secondly, for us, for for me individually, anyways, it's about uh, open discussion and. Um, just checking in with them on a personal level, uh, how, how their work-life balance is going, uh, what are their pain points, and uh, having that connection with them and that they can also then sharing some of that from my perspective with them back. Hey, these are things going on in my life. These are, you know, and we just share a common goal and connection and it becomes more about our relationship together and common goals than boss employee type uh, arrangement. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. Well, one thing I'm kind of curious and go just a a tiny bit off script. It's related to this uh, though, you know, in in the world that we live in today, um, there's a lot of opportunity to brand one's self personally, right? We look at all the opportunities we have to put our, uh, thoughts and opinions and uh, wins and losses and things on say like LinkedIn or or Snapchat or Twitter or X or whatever, and, you know, different social media platforms. Um, I, I see there's a, a big opportunity for, for motivated salespeople to be able to go that direction um, and then pick the team that they want to play on. And then there's also, you know, the, uh, the old, our, our, our traditional model where we have companies that are building brands, right. And then you pick people to play for the brand. Right. And so it seems like there's a little bit of this, this movement to where almost the personal brand in some ways outranks the, 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 the business brand these days. Are, are you seeing any of that in the, in this agribusiness space that, that we're in? And, and I'm just kind of curious on your thoughts on, on how that plays. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't thought about that particular question, but mm-hmm. uh, clearly, uh, with the social media platforms, they're often about yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're an active user, hey, I'm doing this today, I'm doing that today, this is a big win. And mm-hmm. for the younger generation, I'm not even sure it feels like self-promotion. It's more of a cultural how they communicate with each other yeah. uh, in in a way. Um, great example of that, uh, I talked with a former friend of mine. He said, you know, my dad and my brother, they farmed side by side, shared equipment uh, their whole lives. Uh, They wouldn't tell each other what their yields were. Me and my brother now, cousins, we do the same, but um, we'll at least give them, you know, we'll share a little more information. And yes, this, this one's yielding better. This one's not. He said, now our kids... It, they're showing pictures of the monitor and the combine and on the fly. Hey, look, we're yielding this. This is great. You know, they just yeah. share They're more comfortable with sharing that type of information. Man, I wouldn't necessarily classify it as self branding. Yeah. But just more how they communicate. However, that being said, mm-hmm. there's plenty of opportunity to self brand. And for some, you know, maybe you get the feeling they're, but always on the lookout for the next opportunity. They want to be, be noticed in this way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not my personal I, style, I, but I think um, there right. may be a place for that, you know? Well, I think the, per, you know, the, for me, if you, if you, let's, let's take your, being in a B2B, you know, business to business setup, you're maybe you're selling through ag retail or um, working on, you know, working relationships that way in some sort of a B2B setting. It's a little bit different because here, you know, here's an opportunity for, for me to connect with other decision makers that 
that may see this, right? So there's, I, I bring value to my business, to my company, the brand I represent when I'm, when I'm willing to uh, talk about some of the things that I'm doing, some of the things that we're doing as a company, the shows that we're at, the products we have, the results we're getting, things like that. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I see a lot of this happening, being encouraged by brands and companies in the B2C realm. You see this more like Snapchat, Instagram, some stories, you know, things like that. Anyway, I think it's just an interesting thing as we're talking about like attraction and retention. Yeah. I think we got to be aware of like, what are some ways that we can encourage people to want to uh, be, be powerful in their own right, but then also want to come play in our team? Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's uh uh well it's it is a challenge because uh talent pool is a little bit short right now you know yeah. it's, the, the marketplace uh is in favor of the uh employee per se uh supply and demand is yeah. in their their place so you want to create uh uh wet the appetite a little bit that says something about your company and about what you're doing and it tries to draw people one thing I would say as a caution around that is, is mm -hmm. it's easy to cherry pick certain things and it may be it uh, doesn't fully represent who you are as a company. You can create a, um, a letdown. Hey, wait a minute. I, I, I've signed up now. Weren't you the guys doing all this fun stuff? Where's all the fun? No, mm -hmm. well, we got to do work too. We got to do this. We got to do that. You know, <laughs> so there's that balance yeah. of, you know, you don't want to create an image or something that is misrepresenting you a little bit or makes it so favorable that those that then engage, whether it's a customer or mm -hmm. uh, you're attracting talent um, that says, oh, this, this, this is kind of a letdown. This isn't what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And so well, yeah. th so this is where culture becomes really important. So let's go there for a minute. You know, I mean, from a from a cultural from a culture creation and doing this in, in, intentionally. So, um, how how has that helped you with your team? How have you, how has that benefited you in the past? Um, as far as like you know, having good strong culture and, and wanting to play for that team or have people want to come play for yours. Yeah. So, um, uh, I think uh, well. Let me start by saying a little bit of the culture of Hello Nature uh, really f rolls out of our CEO, uh, global CEO, Luca Bonini, a uh, member of the uh, owning family. And he's very entrepreneurial and casts a lot of vision for freedom to operate and being entrepreneurial. And um, we like to attract those kind of people. And so if you watch Hello Nature, he's uh, our our media outlets are always about something new. We're doing some, you know, he's very we're very innovative as a group and we want to attract people that think like that. Yeah. You know, we're not commodity sellers. Um, we're and we're not just out meeting demand. We're creating demand when you're in the value add business you have to create demand. And so, yeah, I would say it's helped us, uh, on a global basis. We've grown a lot and, um, it, it's, we've attracted people, uh, for the most part, um, uh, sometimes yeah. marine manager, uh, the guy's a pretty good interviewer and the guy don't, I don't get it right. Or my counterparts don't get it right. I'm sure some time to time, but sure. in general, that's what we're after. And if you're, um, you try and be intentional in starting the whole process of drawing somebody in is asking the kinds of questions in an interview on how they like to be managed, how, mm -hmm. uh, define for me what it means in your mind, the difference between meeting demand and demand creation and mm -hmm. try and sort that out, um, uh, in the, in the process. And, uh, cause not, not everybody likes, uh, entrepreneurialism. Not everybody likes, uh, that kind of a, of a structure they want, they need a little more defined, a more uh, set of boxes that, and they can thrive in that. That's, it's not a, a wrong and a right here. It's just a, it's a difference. And so um, I, I think it's helped us. The media side has helped at least portray that image of that. Mm -hmm. We are innovative um, and we have been. And so yeah. I think it's helped us. That's really cool. And, and you, you bring up some really interesting, a uh, couple of really interesting points right there that I want to just 
tap on for people really quick. So if, if you want that, if you, or if you think you want that person who's very entrepreneurial that to join your culture because you want to go create some demand in the market for your, your product or thing or whatever it is, right? Um, that's uh, th that may be a very different human than the one who you are used to sort of telling where to go and, and when to be there and what they can and can't do. Yeah. Right. Because, oh. yeah. <laughs> and and, and yeah. some people say, Oh, I want somebody who's entrepreneurial. I want, you know, I want them to go, you know, not knock down some doors and that. Well, that, I mean, there are, there are some things that come along with a person like that. Like that person's going to have new ideas and that person's going to be constantly tapping back on, on your, um, text messages and emails with like, Hey, have you thought about this? Hey, I got this idea. Hey, what, what do you think about going this way? And if, if you as a leader are not intentional enough and ready for that kind of person, you, 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 a will either miss opportunity or B you're going to start to push that person away and they're going to go look for some place where they can express that. Oh yeah. And um, back to uh, where we started a little bit also as these, they bring you these, um, that's why the intentionality and the transparency is important because, yeah. um, you need to be able to help them then see it through that matrix. Is this worth your time? Is this where you, you want to yeah. go? And I usually, I know there's a balance cause I usually see it when we swing past, you know, it's like, Oh, hey, there it was, uh, <laughs> you know, we yeah. go back and forth behind it. But, um, because in that environment you can, you're usually going to end up with too many skews. You're going to end up with you know, a little bit of a mixed bag because you've chased some of that entrepreneurialism and has led you down, down some trails. And so, um, that's, uh, that's some of the risk that come with that. Um, but I've always viewed it as an acceptable risk, uh, is easier than just never taking advantage of, of things because you're, you know, we go this way and we have this protocol and, right. you know, the, the world doesn't move. The customer doesn't move at your, uh, under your, uh, milestones, uh, that you got to make for your development system. He's got problems. Now he's looking for solutions. Can you help him get there? And, uh, you know, so. Yeah. Well, it, 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 there really does require, this is why we talk about intentional leadership. It requires so much intentional leadership, so much intention to be able to create a functioning environment within which that person can thrive. So are you optimized now? What if this person has goes out there and just lights up the calendar and says, "Hey, come to this meeting. I want you to come to this meeting. I need, you. especially when they're new, early. Maybe they don't know all the products yet. Maybe yeah. they need a little bit of help structuring proposals, you know, deals and things like that." And uh, so, are you ready? Because maybe you got that person, plus you got five or six other people at the same time, or ten that you got to take care of as well. Now, on the flip side of that, let's go to the the other direction. Maybe you need somebody who's a little bit more of a uh, that follows protocol, right? And we're, and we're going to be a culture that's less entrepreneurial, but it's more like, Hey, here's the sales system. And this is step one. And this is step two. And this is step three. And this is exactly what we do. Right. Now that's a different yeah. breed of person. Um, that, that, and, and there are people that fit into that category. And then the last one I'm thinking about John also is maybe somebody, um, there's earlier career. I don't really know where they fit into that category yet, but the, the one thing that we can almost promise about the next generation is they've been told what to do for most of their life up to this point. So you have a new generation yeah. that maybe looks at entrepreneurship and thinks it looks sexy, but they haven't had a lot of experience in going out and actually doing demand creation. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, yep. I think there's two, uh, as you use, visit with folks, there's, um, they maybe have a little bit of the entrepreneurial, um, spirit in them that that's, they've had some, they have some ideas or they're, they're a good thinker in this way, but they've been in the wrong system and they've been kind of beat down mm -hmm. a little bit through their career, or they've not, they've been in a, an environment that's, uh, not so tolerable of say mistakes or poor decisions. Sure. And, um, uh, you know, so, um, I was very fortunate, um, early in my career, I had a boss, uh, and he just said, John, you, I, I will never fire you for making a mistake. I, I, I might, if you lie to me about it, so don't just tell me the truth, but 
you know, he didn't want, he didn't, and he lived by that. He, he, uh -huh. uh, he, you know, he, he was okay. He was willing to accept some mistakes so that we, I would learn, we would learn. And, um, but if, boy, if you've been tried a few things and been beat down, you, you, you start to say, well, I'm not doing that. And yet inside that person, there's that skill set. you know, they're thinking uh -huh. that. And so it's really you, you, to have an entrepreneur culture. Yes. You got to be ready for the flood of ideas, but you, you got to be willing to let them make some mistakes. You got to be willing to let them kind of run, let the dogs run a little bit. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're going to make some mistakes, but um, it, it comes with, it comes with the idea, you know, absolutely. I agree. Well, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, you feel, feel free to share any, any background, uh, but what, uh, you know, what kind what kind of roles have you found yourself in over the years, you know, that, that have led you into where you're, where you're at now? Uh, well, I've always been sales marketing side, my, my trainings in marketing really in, in that, uh, uh, sense of the word from, from education. But, um, uh, I like, team i like building things mm -hmm. and um i've uh, i like starting with uh little and trying to build on it and build something i um i'm less enthralled by um uh, hey there's this nice book of business let's take that over and maintain it um there's a role for that and we need those kinds of people mm -hmm. uh it, it just don't call me <laughs> because I won't, <laughs> I, I won't get too excited about that. And sure. um, I, I was just thinking about not that particular question, but was chatting with somebody uh, a, a while back. They asked me a similar idea on the different things I've done. And I think almost every job I've had, I was the first person to actually have that job in that organization. Okay. Yeah. So there was no, there was no predecessor. Uh, there was no um, team of people or say, or baggage or goods and wins and losses. It just was kind of a blank sheet. And uh, Hello Nature was no um, exception to that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've been here 10 years, but I was their privilege to be their first employee in the United States. Sure. They didn't have a label in the US. They didn't have a registration. They didn't have a customer. They yes. just have a, a desire and a, and a technology uh, that they, Luca felt could fit in the U S market. So mm -hmm. for me, that was exciting. That's, I, yeah, I, that's I love cool. building something. So those roles uh, that that's where I've, um, I've had, I would say my most uh, pleasurable and most satisfying is, is building and. Uh, so uh, it's, people, so it's almost products, almost whatever, you know, Right. So it's almost been like you're playing that entrepreneurial role, but it's really the in, intrapreneurial role, right? And, and building out the the teams and the systems and and uh, everything that goes along with building that book of business and and um, and that, you know, the country PL or whatever it may be in your guys' case. So uh, that's that's a it's a great place. And I and I wish more people would think of themselves as an intro intro. I call it the intrapreneur. Mm. Right? Yeah, inside the organization. Because I, I, I think it, it just it shows that you have so much ownership when people step up and think about um, ways to lead, ways to help the company move forward, you know, ways to help capture. Because you know, in in reality, if if somebody wanted to come in and and uh, and start my business, you know, tomorrow, it will take them time and a lot of money and a lot of years to build the reputation and the content and the and all the you know, the, the reps and the brand recognition, and it's, you know, a few million dollars in our case, <laughs> yeah. you know, that we've probably invested over the years and a lot of time and a lot of heartache and a lot of wins. So, um, but man, if you want to come alongside and help us grow, right. Like we've got a platform upon yeah. which you can do that and, and get financially rewarded and be also, um, feel good, right. About what you're doing for a living. So, right. Yeah. Love that. Love the uh, people like that. So uh, what kind of resources would you recommend folks be paying attention to? What kind of books you're reading, uh, podcasts you listen to? What's your. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, one, uh, I'll just kind of focus on one there. That's kind of a recent for me. Read a lot of stuff over the years. Um, mm -hmm. I would say I read maybe a, 
um, a little less of the marketing strategy type books as I've gotten further along in my career. I've, um, you know, I'm implementing things that I've learned from years of it. Right. And you're not always just looking for that fresh idea. You can, you can kind of always just be changing if you're, if you're not mindful, but one I've read recently, and I'm sure many of your listeners have read, and that's a, uh, Jocko Wilnick's Wilnick's uh, work on extreme ownership. Yep. And um, I, uh, I've read it. I've listened to it. It's and what I really like about it is the the I love the personal accountability that it drives, mm. and um, and it really challenged me to say, hey, you know, when we've got challenges, don't be looking around and saying who didn't do their role start with, you know, me and say, what didn't I do? How did I not help my team succeed? Uh, and, um, I, I think if, if we can have personal accountability, which culture as a whole doesn't really like that, they're always looking to blame somebody, uh, in general, you know, the victim in culture of victimhood, but, uh, that'll, that'll do you well, uh, as a young guy coming up, if you're willing to just, admit a mistake or take ownership in it. Um, I, I found that very, um, uh, uh, just a spot on book and a helpful, um, uh, yeah. you know, refresher for me and, uh, it'd be good advice to anybody in all yeah. facets of life, not just in a career. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic book and, uh, I've, I've listened to that and, um, dichotomy of leadership also the, you know, their other book that, um, that he and Leif have put together. So, and, and, and I've told, I think I've said it on, even on the show before that there's a, that there's a leadership program I'm going to invest in. That's not mine. <laughs> uh, some of their, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah they, they have a competitor program to battlefield leadership, which I know a lot of people in the ag industry have done over the years uh, where, where Jocko actually will take, you know, goes with, with a group of people out to uh, say the, the battle of little bighorn. Uh, or Gettysburg or Normandy or whatever. And and they go through the decision-making that leaders are making in real time. And, you know, you spend a couple of days out there going through all this and walking around and looking at the plays that were made and then debriefing it uh, from a battle, from a true, you know, battle hardened person's perspective. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. 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 Great. Would uh, highly recommend that. Cool. Any, any other, other than, um, uh, extreme ownership by by Jocko. Any other podcasts or or yeah? You, well, I I stars? like uh, yep. Um, this guy would get an answer to one of my most uh, admired guys as well. But uh, I really enjoyed John Maxwell's thoughts on on yeah. leadership, and um, he uh, I I heard him speak early in uh, my career, nineteen ninety four at a conference and he mm-hmm. wasn't quite so famous then he was just more of an up and comer, but, um, he had top 10 things to be successful was the title of his, of his, uh, thing. And, uh, I, I, I remember three of the 10 here all these years yeah. later. Now let's see <laughs> 30 years later, right. It's 19. That's pretty good. And, uh, but his first one was really impacted my, my life, uh, view. And he said, get a new, de- get, get a correct or a new definition of success. Mm. And his definition of success he laid out for us that day was uh, when the people that are closest to you and know you the best mm. are the ones that love you the most. That's mm. success. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, I just, that was powerful to me as a young guy um and you know ambitious wanting to you know achieve a lot of goals and it just kind of turned me a little bit to say hey it, uh, it, if you accomplish something but you leave your wife or your children or your family or you know your close friends whatever if you if you're hurting those people in the process that's not really success so yeah. you know do this in a way that that keeps that in perspective and um haven't always done that perfectly of course but uh it's always been in the frame frame of my mind and um 
I don't know if they even talked about work-life balance in 1994 yet or not as a term, but <laughs> that's really in a sense what he was talking about. Don't, don't leave those because yeah. that's who you're going to need. That's who you're going to want to be with. That's what it needs to be about, not about some goal. Those goals can be important to help you accomplish something and put into other people's life. Um, right. Be careful what it costs you and mm -hmm. just be careful of it. And um, that, that really helped me. And consequently, I've, I've read a lot of Maxwell's books on sure. leader. I follow him and um, just, I appreciate his insight. And um, it's almost always uh, about helping other people succeed. Yeah. And I, I like that. I like that point of view. I love it. You know, I love Maxwell. Uh, his work was was big for me back in the day when I was coming up through FFA uh, in in the nineties. Um, you know, in the mid nineties, and you know, he we we were we would go to our FFA leadership conferences, and they'd talk about uh, you know the definition of leadership, and leadership is influence, and that was the straight out of the Maxwell book, and that was man, anybody, any kid that came up in FFA during that ten year window, maybe to this day, I don't know. Uh, but for sure knew exactly what the definition of leadership was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's written into their mission statement, I think, as a result of that. So, yeah. 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 It's good. Good stuff. You know, in, in what you're saying there brings, I just want to kind of touch on this before we go to our last question. There's an interesting piece about this that I think is important now for intentional leaders or people that want to be more intentional as leaders to really understand. And it is in um, how, how people see you leading in all areas of life. So, you know, if, if the definition of, of success is those people closest to you still love you, uh, if that's going back to his, his, his original from, you know, 30 years ago, then, uh, that, so then that's important. And so what, how do people see, how do your employees see you maintaining those relationships? How do your employees see you uh, showing up and and taking care of your your personal health, right? As an example, or what does that look like? Or or in, in, this is my criticism because now today you have the ability to schedule emails to go out when you want them to go out. You don't have I don't have to receive an email from you at eleven thirty at night with an with a with a perceived expected response, <laughs> right? Yet that night or or first thing in the morning, right? So. You know, there are a lot of ways that we can intentionally influence people around us by really showing and really being intentional for, uh, you know, for ourselves and, and being really, um, really intentional on those goals, what that gets to look, look like and, and, and paying attention to that as well. So I want, just kind of want to throw that in because I think that parlays into not only your family, but man, how do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of those work relationships? How do your employees see you managing your time? Because what mm -hmm. I promise you is there is a unwritten perceived perception. Per, there's an unwritten perception that I need to go just like you do if I report mm -hmm. to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and you'd probably get uh, good answers. If you'd ask my employees, you know, they would tell you, <laughs> see right. some things that I think uh, would weave into that conversation um, is, uh, like maybe a group's in town for mm. two nights. You know what? You, you guys are in town. You take care of this night. I, I'm going to go home and get a timer around the table with my wife and my kids, you yeah. know, and give them the same permission. I don't put an expectation if I'm riding with a sales guy and we're in his hometown, uh, look, I'll, I can get dinner on my own. I can order a salad up or, a uh, a cheeseburger or whatever I want to get from room service, or I can walk down to the restaurant. You go home and spend that time with your wife, give them permission to do that. Um, you know, they might say, Hey, John cuts out early on, on Mondays because, you know, he's got this, um, uh, series that he, I lecture on Monday nights for a local group sure. and, um, uh, they, they know that about me. And so they, they know that I, I don't travel on Mondays unless it's absolutely necessary. Next week will be one of them because mm -hmm. we got to be yep. there first thing in the morning on Tuesday morning for, for your That's meeting. Right. And so uh, Monday will be a travel day, but that'll be the, the first in a long time uh, sure. that I'll actually stay somewhere else on a Monday night. So 
uh, I, and I'm open to talk about those priorities in my life that are involve family, involve other things that I do and give them permission to do the same. Yeah. And, and, and that counts out just a natural conversation and being intentional about it. They, 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 you know, they see me, they know, um, and, um, uh, they know my behavior when we're on the road, they know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not two different people certainly try not to be. And, uh, and it's okay. I'll have sales guys say called one, uh, a week or so ago. And John, he called, I'm going to be late to the meeting because my wife couldn't take, uh, you know, my daughter to school and I need to get her to school this morning. Yep. He was perfectly comfortable telling me that, which is, that's encouraging to me. I want him to have that freedom uh, to to do that and and give give time to where it's important. And I think we're better off and we'll do better at accomplishing our goals if we have the balance. If you get, you know, that's the lie. I got to do all of this all the time to get to where I want to go. And when mm -hmm. I get there, then I'll come back and grab this and make it right. And mm -hmm. not, to, you know, you're just. If you're balanced, that your mental health is strong, um, then that's uh, you, you'll be more effective uh, at maximizing productivity, your time, your thinking, all of that will will hone in better. Absolutely. Well, John, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate all of your time and and your intention that you put into your to your answers and preparation and everything. Uh, any any last thoughts that you'd like to leave with the uh, the intentional agribusiness leader? team here today before we bring it in for a landing uh well um don't be afraid of uh making a mistake um one of your mm -hmm. questions uh was about vulnerability mm -hmm. that's what was kind of on my mind as i was thinking about that but yeah. uh allow yourself to uh, be a little bit vulnerable uh, they know you're not perfect and they know you don't have all the answers so if you're willing to be a little bit vulnerable, you'll invite that from them mm -hmm. and they'll be much, uh, you, your team will be much quicker to seek some help, let you know when they're struggling uh, with something, whether it's personal or uh, business related, um, yeah. they will, uh, and that'll build some real connectivity and uh, common ground that that's, that makes a team. You bet. I love it. And that's a great place to great place to land it. Guys, check out Hello Nature and uh, John Lehman. And uh, John, thanks for being here, man. It's been a uh, oh, appreciate the opportunity. And we'll look forward to seeing it at your conference next you week. Bet. Excited. Thriving right. leader. If you can't make it to Nashville uh, this time around, man, come hang out with us in Kansas City. Those of you guys listening in Kansas City, August 21 and 22, we're going to be down there. Come hang out. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Mark. Have a good day. You bet. Thank you.